This presentation will be a few selected highlights regarding the wonderful marriage between science and beer production. In principle, beer is one of the simplest uh, commodities we know when it comes to uh, enjoying alcohol, and it actually only contains very few raw materials. It contains some malt, which is derived from barley, contains water, contains hops, and it contains, at least during some part of the process, some yeast that will convert the sugar into alcohols. But the thing is that even though this is such a simple commodity with so few raw materials, it's actually a very, very complex uh, thing to brew a beer. And I always say that in principle, food science is more complicated than rocket science because we actually have to take into account, apart from the natural sciences, also the consumer science and the behavior of people and stuff like that, that is not necessarily always taken into account if you only have to send a rocket to the moon. As I don't have time to talk about all the processes of beer, I am pinpointing three things that I find particularly fascinating about producing beer. The first one is that beer is different from all other alcoholic beverages in the sense that we cannot naturally ferment um, grains. If you take a grain, it contains star a starch, and starch is a storage carbohydrate. That means that it's a carbohydrate that is, has the primary uh, purpose of producing new plants. But yeast, that is the organism that we use for converting uh, sugars into alcohol, are not able to utilize starch. So that means that every time we want to make beer, we have to make an extra ninja trick to convert the starch into utilizable sugars for the yeast. But the beauty is that the enzymes that are required for this is already part of barley, because in principle, barley is a grain that is supposed to fall to the ground and develop into a new barley plant. So that means that the storage carbohydrates, it has the starch, is actually supposed to be utilized in order to produce a rootlet and to produce the first uh, leaf before uh, photosynthesis can start. So that means that the barley contains its own set of enzymes for utilizing these different things. Fortunately for us, the different enzymes that are necessary for beer production have different temperature optimums. So that means that by gradually increasing the temperature of the, mm, the soup that we are producing, we can actually uh, activate one enzyme at a time. So that means that we start at below 50 degrees, 45 degrees, for example. And here we are working with a um, beta amylase that is preventing the final beer from being slightly slimy because there are some components in barley that has the same texture as if, for, for, if you, for example, make an oat porridge. After we remove that, we increase the temperature till 52, 53 degrees, where proteases are active, and proteases will degrade proteins. The interesting thing about degrading proteins is that we don't want too much protein in our beer, because a lot of protein is normally equal to haze, it's equal to a turbid beer, and most people will actually prefer a beer that is very, very transparent rather than opaque. On the other hand, we don't want to degrade the protein too much, because if we produce a liquid that is devoid of protein, we cannot create foam, because it is proteinaceous material that is part of forming foam. So that means that we always have a choice, but we, we can't win uh, in the sense that we either get a slightly turbid beer with a wonderful foam, or we get a very, very clear beer, but with a disappointing foam, a foam that will, that will form, but then will collapse very soon. Now, one of the things as a commercial brewer is that they also know the consumers. And what we know is that if you go to a pub and you ask for two beers and one of them is turbid with a wonderful foam and the other one is actually clear but with a disappointing foam, most people will return the turbid one, at least if they are asking for a lager, simply because this is not what they expected. So that means that most commercially brewed beers are actually quite uh, minimal in protein content, which also means that the, the, the foam is, is not very satisfactory. That's always something you can also impress your friends by pointing out when you're drinking. After we have degraded a certain proportion of the protein, we want to degrade the starch into sugars. And actually, we have two different starch amylases um, working in, in, in barley. One of them is called beta amylase, and the other one is called alpha amylase. The reason I'm mentioning beta amylase first is that is the most active enzyme, and that is an enzyme that is very good at cutting off two glucose moieties, which is called maltose, from the end of all strings of polymers. The problem is that some part of the starch is actually branched, 
that means that it sticks in more directions than one. And that means that every time you reach a branching point, the beta amylase can no longer do its job. Fortunately, the other enzyme, the alpha amylase, is a very random cutter. So that means it just cuts randomly wherever it finds a bond between two glucose moieties. But every time it cuts, it creates two new ends for the beta amylase to start cutting, which means that the combined effect of these two enzymes is that a satisfactory large amount of the starch is converted into sugar. And a satisfactory large amount means that a good proportion is converted so we can get alcohol. A small proportion is left to provide some kind of what we call mouthfeel, the feeling that it's not a watery beer, but something with some kind of viscosity. After we converted all the starch into sugar water, we, we no longer need the rest of the, the, the hard material. Primarily, this is the husks, the outer part of the grain. These husks are still uh, following us throughout the process, which means that at now they will fall to the bottom of the container and we can then start filtering through the husks and thereby utilizing that a lot of particulate material will be caught in the husks and therefore we will get a clear liquid out with uh, the built-in coffee filter taking up all the particulate material. After that, we'll start boiling the product called Word at this point. The reason we are boiling it are twofold. One of them is the classical that every time we boil something, we get a um, we get a sterile product. And actually, in for example, medieval times, this was known to be very uh, desirable, meaning that everybody drinking from the well would get heavy diarrhea, whereas everybody drinking beer would stay healthy. The other thing is that there is a compound in beer that requires boiling, and that is hops. Hops is the bittering compound in beer that causes this pronounced bitterness that we know is there. And the compound that are responsible for this is called iso-alpha acids. And they actually start as alpha acids, which are lipophilic, meaning that they prefer to be in an oily state rather than in a watery state. But by boiling them, we isomerize them into iso-alpha acids. And iso-alpha acids are more water soluble than the alpha acids, which means that during one hour of boiling, we get a larger proportion of these alpha acids to, to diffuse from the oil layer into the watery layer and thereby provide the bitterness. The bitterness is interesting simply because that is what provides the antimicrobial effect of beer. And that means that originally we started using hops because we could make beer last longer. Instead of having a shelf life of a week, we could suddenly have a shelf life of three months, four months, for example. But the surprising thing is, how did it actually come about? Because the first time people start drinking beer, it's not a pleasant uh, it's not a pleasant experience for most because this pronounced bitterness is um, is something that you want to spit out. And actually, we can see when we examine people's brains that it is a natural thing to spit out stuff when it's bitter, and that is probably an evolutionary trait because a lot of things that are poisonous in nature are also bitter. So it's a good idea to spit out something that is that is bitter because there are there is a large chance that it's uh, that is poisonous. But somehow a lazy monk produced a beer that was bitter. And the thing was that the, the result they came up with was that maybe it was bitter, but it lasted so long. And again, then we come back to one of the things that is also desirable about beer is that it has a very high uniform quality. So that means in old age, when you did a beer without hops, it was perfect on day one, semi good on day three, and already awful on day seven. These hoppy beers were then perhaps hoppy, perhaps slightly bitter, and you have to get used to it. But after that, it was the same kind of flavor after a week, after f two weeks, after three months. So that also means that the, the rumor in Europe spreads this hoppy thing, this is the shit. This is good because it's actually the same every time you produce it. And as a side note, different varieties of hop will have slightly different flavors because there are also some other flavors, uh, some other compounds that provide flavor in hops. And due to this, it's important if you want to be a beer snob to memorize as many uh, name of hop varieties as possible. This is the equivalent of being a red wine snob and name dropping varieties of grapes because it may not say anything about the quality of the beer, but at least it means that you've read the website or my presentation at some point. The last thing I'd like to talk about is the production of alcohol from sugar, which is in beer produced by brewer's yeast.
But again, also, I'd like you to make a little leap of faith and try and imagine for a second that we actually use pigs instead of yeast for producing um, alcohol. We say we put 1,000 pigs into a big soup of liquid sugar, and then we allow it to just swim about for a week while they eat the sugar and defecate. And after that, we will then filter off the pigs and try and drink the resulting product. It will not be very pleasant because some of the waste product of, of pork is similar to waste product from human beings, and that is not desirable. But in principle, what we are drinking are the yeast waste product. We are drinking the yeast's feces. It's shitting out alcohol and carbon dioxide every time it's eating sugar. But the fortunate thing for us is that it is actually a much more pleasant flavor, at least for us. But the yeast has the problem that it is its shit. So that means it's not nice for the yeast to swim around in its own feces. And two of the things that are most anti-fungal uh, is actually the ethanol it's producing and the carboxylic acids that it's producing. Fortunately, the yeast has another trick up its sleeve, and that is producing esters. Because by combining an alcohol and a carboxylic acid, you can produce an ester. And an ester is inert when it comes to being antifungal, meaning it's not poisonous, it's not toxic to the yeast. The, the plus for the people that are consuming it is that the esters normally have nice flavors. The esters is the thing that you normally smell if you buy um, flavored wine gums that taste like... Um, that tastes like uh, fruit. Um, and to take an example, a uh, Heineken beer will have a pronounced amount of isoamyl acetate, which is the flavor of banana. So you can simply open a Heineken and smell it and get a faint, faint smell of banana, which is unique for that yeast. But this is also one thing is, each yeast has its own fingerprint of esters. So that means that that's why a Carlsberg is different from a Tubal, is different from a Royal, is different from a Heineken. It is simply because each individual yeast will have its own way of saying, I am after defecating, now combining the ethanols and the carboxylic acids into this combination of many different esters. What I just talked about was actually only three part processes of the full process of producing beer, the conversion of starch into sugar, the boiling that converts the alpha acids into, uh, alpha acids into iso alpha acids, and the conversion of the sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. But there are many more processes that could be covered in equal detail if we had more time for it. But this is actually only about the production of the beer. Apart from that, we also have to, after making the beer, having to uh, get it to the market. So that means that we need to know something about branding, something about how you tell the story of CO2 neutral methods of distribution, or, and this is the final point of my presentation, we cannot precisely say what will be the future of how science will interact with beer production. Because we don't know what will happen, but what we can be absolutely certain is that the marriage between science and beer production has been long, and it will continue for ages. And that was all. Thank you. <laughs>